Good morning, more officially, uh, and very, I very much want to welcome you to this beginning of our fifth year of the Pilgrim Forum. Can you believe it? it's our fifth year now, Dr. Ritter? Um, this has been a wonderful series, and um, much to our surprise, everyone keeps surprise and delight. Everyone keeps uh, coming here for 7.30 in the morning, um, which is wonderful. And when I woke up today, I thought, well, if there's precipitation, it must be the Pilgrim Forum, because um, it seems to happen every time. At least snow, I think, is a lot prettier than, uh, than cold rain in the late fall. Um, I'm Julie Massey. I'm Associate Vice President for Mission and Student Affairs here at St. Norbert. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be a terrific morning. Again, for any of you who are our regulars and might remember last spring, um, we're very excited that our speaker is here with us today. <laughs> um, and you'll be very excited too, and, and, and shortly he'll be introduced. But before we go any further, let's take, us, take a moment to gather together in prayer. Good and loving God, as the hush of new fallen snow greets the early morn, we are reminded of your call to quiet in this time of busy preparations. Your call to moments of contemplation that shape our vision to glimpse the many ways you are present to us and throughout the world. Bless us this morning and throughout the coming Advent season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, as always, we're grateful to Dan Ritter uh, for his inspiration and faithful support of this series. We're thrilled that Dan is able to be with us this morning, along with his wife, who I've always thought of as Martha, but I'm told maybe Nina is more commonly how you're referred to, and his daughter, Catherine. Um, Catherine's an alum of the college from the same year as our own President Brian Brees, who's with us as well this morning. So, yeah. And now it's my pleasure to um, invite up to the podium my friend and colleague, Dr. Howard Ebert, who will be introducing this morning's speaker. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. That response morning. is the same that I get from... <laughs> Maybe it's me. That's the response I get from my 8.30 class, too. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Peter Fan. Fan, a na native of Vietnam, immigrated to the United States in 1975. Peter holds three doctorates, Doctor of Theology from the Salesian University in Rome, Doctor of Philosophy, and a Doctor of Divinity, both from the University of London. He currently holds a chair of Catholic Social Thought at Georgetown University. Previously, he taught at Catholic University of America and Union Theological Seminary. He is nationally and internationally a lecturer and presenter, having just returned from being the uh, Cunningham Lecturer in Edinburgh, Scotland, Scotland to Peer. This is nice, Peter, thank you. Uh, in October 2018, on the topic of migration of Christianity, Christianity of migration. At, late, at that latest count, he is the author of 15 books, though that number is increasing as we speak, I believe, and uh, edited 15 collections, and the author of countless professional essays and monographs. His work reflects a wide range of Peter's scholarly expertise, pastoral interests, and concerns. They range from patristics, ecclesiology, eschatology, mission, enculturation, interreligious dialogue, religious pluralism, and world Christianity. His work has been translated into Italian, German, French, Spanish, Polish, Chinese, Japanese, and Vietnamese. He is not only a uh, published and, and he has not only published and presented wide, widely, but he has been a significant formative voice for contemporary theology. He has served as a mentor, a colleague, uh, and coordinator and is an exemplar for so many of us doing theology in a way that speaks creatively, credibly, and in solidarity with the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized. Many of us today are deeply indebted to him for his witness and dedication. Peter's significant contributions to theology have not gone unnoticed. Uh, in 2010, he was awarded the John Courtney Murray Award this is the highest honor of the Catholic Theological Society of America. 
Incidentally, he was also uh, the first non-Anglo to be elected president of the CTSA. In 2016, a book was published in his honor, focusing on the theme of world Christianity. And in March of 2017, Georgetown University, where he is teaching, hosted an international symposium to examine Peter's influence and legacy entitled Theology Without Borders, celebrating the legacy of Peter C. Fan. He is a recipient of three honorary doctorates. And now closer to home. St. Norbert College has been blessed to have Peter as a frequent guest and a contributor. He is, uh, in the 1990s, he was a presenter on numerous uh, occasions for the Theological Institute, and he was also a Colleen Chair speaker. And little known to many, he played a key role in encouraging the CTS, the College Theology Society, National Professional Society, to hold its national convention here at St. Norbert in 1999 because there was some discussion at this organization, well, we're St. Norbert and they're not going to be able to host us. And Peter was on the board at the time and put in a good word and actually convinced the board. So thank you, Peter. Finally, Peter has been a good friend to so many of us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Fan back to St. Norbert College and for his presentation. I pay so, much, so little for such a commercial that he's giving. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming to this place. Uh, I suspect DuPair, Wisconsin is not a very exciting place. <laughs> if people came out at 7 o'clock in the morning to listen to a lecture of theology, <laughs> so it must be a very boring city, and this is a great thing to do. I thank Julie and Howard for inviting me to make a presentation this time on Pilgrim Forum. The topic that I was assigned to is to say something about one of the articles of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, if you are Catholic, you go to church on Sunday, at least occasionally. <laughs> You will say the creed either in the apostolic, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Apostles' Creed, which is very short, or the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. How long it is, right? Const Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which was formulated in the year 381. Now, according to the legend, the Apostles' Creed was composed by 12 apostles and in 12 articles. Before they left Jerusalem to go around the world, each of them sit down and compose one article which they live in. And one of the articles, of course, is divided into three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and Church, right? And when you are baptized, if you are an adult, the priest or whoever baptized you asks you first, do you believe in God the Father? And da, da, da. Yes, we do. I do. And then do you believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and so forth, make you um, they die and rose and seated at the right hand of the Father? And you say, yes. And if the priest asks you, do you understand what it means? I said, no idea what it means. <laughs> And so this morning I am here to help you understand that particular verse. He is seated, he ascended to heaven and is seated or sits at the right hand of the Father. And I have, when I asked to give the title of this, I was so inspired. I say, going up and sitting down. That was exactly <laughs> what Jesus did. He went up to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So there you have, uh, I will explain that, uh, what it means, and then I will spend my major time to explain what the hell he was doing all the time up there, right? <laughs> so what was Jesus doing after his resurrection, after he ascended to heaven and to uh, sit down at the head of the Father. So there you have the topic of my uh, lecture. First of all, I'd like to introduce you into the topic. He ascended to heaven 
And he took his seat, or is seated, at the right hand of the Father, or God, the Father Almighty, and then the third, and he shall come again to judge living the dead. These are the three activities that are always connected. You confess that he ascended to heaven, and then he sits right hand of the Father, and then will come again the living the dead. So there you have. Now, this phrase, um, he ascended to heaven. Can you move up? a little bit there. There you have. You have the, I'd like to spend some time talking about where does it come from, this, this, this uh, phrase that he seated at right hand the Father. Now, as I said, it is part of the Apostles' Creed. But before that, now the Apostles' Creed, uh, you may know, Although the legend was that it was composed by the 12 apostles, actually it was used in Rome as a baptismal ritual. Like when you baptize, you recite the creed. And it started sometime in the 10th century that started to be used. So that was the later. But earlier, you find that phrase in the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus on the third century. Now Hippolytus was presumably the Bishop of Rome and as Bishop of Rome he has little to do so he composed a book called the Apostolic Tradition. Uh, in this book he has a ritual of baptism and ordination. So you have very early testimony to the fact that this is the way how Christians in Rome baptize. And in that book, for the first time, besides the uh, Apostolic, uh, uh, the Apostles' Creed, you have the statement that Jesus ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's the earliest one. And the next one, we call it the symbol of St. Ambrose. Again, St. Ambrose didn't write it, but it attributed to him. So it's very interesting. In those days you don't write book and people just give you the credit <laughs> for tenure and promotion, you know. <laughs> Ambro was a bishop of Milan in the 4th and 5th century. He was very instrumental in the conversion of St. Augustine. But this symbol, meaning the creed, that one way in Greek is symbolon, and in Greek, that symbol means the two pieces joined together. So this is the profession of faith. Now, in this profession of faith of the year 397, a little bit later, again you have the sentence, He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I wonder whether they understood what it meant, but it was there. But again, in the symbol of Rufinus, Rufinus was a Roman Italian. And the year, about 5th uh, century, he wrote a book. Uh, and he has also a symbol, a creed, in which he reaffirmed, recited again the phrase, and he seated right hand of the Father. So in the fourth, I talk about the Roman order of baptism, that is the Greek apostles, Greek, as I said, in the 10th century, we know that it was used in Rome, and then eventually it became the symbol of the West. You know, that's how we all grew up reciting the symbol, the short, the 12 articles in the Mass. Later on, they substitute a much longer uh, uh, creed and the Nicene Constantinopolitan creed that uh, we have today. In the, now, interestingly enough, it is not found in the symbol, the creed of Eusebius of Caesarea and the symbol of Nicaea. It's interesting. Now, at Nicaea, in 325, there was a debate whether Jesus was God, whether Jesus was just a living human being, uh, a superhuman being, or he was God. And the person who provoked this uh, debate was a priest from Alexandria. His name is Arius. And the Emperor Constantine was very worried about the unity of his empire, and so he called a council in Nicaea. Today it is in Turkey, uh, Asia Minor at the time, very close to Constantinople. You know Constantinople is a city founded by Emperor Constantine, correct? 
and he's very humble man, so he named after himself Constantinople, the city of Constantine. So if Donald Trump come to the pair, he would have a city called Trumpian city, just like, similar like that. Now, interestingly enough, that council adopted the creed of the Bishop of Caesarea Eusebius to use it. But there is no mention of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. You guess why? Now, remember the debate was on the divinity of Jesus. And you say Jesus sat on the right hand of the Father, it means that he less than the Father. So in order to confirm, affirm the divinity of Jesus, they can now now leave the sign. No, sit right hand is not really the middle, right? The right hand. So to affirm the equality of Jesus with the Father, that phrase was left out. Whether intentional or not, but certainly in the context of debate about the divinity of Jesus, to say that Jesus sitting right hand is some less than the Father. No? And again, it is found again in the creed of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, a bishop of Jerusalem. And Cyril wrote a lot of writings about baptismal, baptism. And in that Baptist discourse on baptism, he inserted the phrase again, he was seated right hand of the Father, and you have the symbol of Epiphanius, and the famous one is 381, the first council of Constantinople, where the question was, Nicaea 325, Jesus is God. 381, what about the Holy Spirit? They didn't discuss that in 325. And eventually, for 30 years, they were dis debating whether you could say even the Holy Spirit was God. And so, in 381, on Constantinople, the Synod, the Council, decided, yes, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and give of life, who proceeds from the Father, who speaks to the prophet, and so on. That phrase is now inserted into the creed. That's why the most complete symbol of creed is the one of Constantinople 381, and that's the one we most Catholics say in, on Sunday. That's the story of this symbol. The next question is, what does it mean? What, where do you get this, this, this thing here? He ascended into heaven and is seated right hand. So everything in Christian theology, we go back to the Bible and find out where it is found. So for the next, my second part is I talk about this phrase, the roots of this phrase in the Bible. Now, if you want to know uh, what the Bible says about anything, you don't go to Howard Ebert. That's not the place to go. <laughs> Much less to the president. He, he's fundraising. He's not interested in, in the Bible. <laughs> so where do you go? The source of all knowledge today. Google. Google. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Go to Google. All right. And put in the phrase, he ascended to heaven. Where is it in the Bible? And you have thousands and thousands of hits, you know? And one of them has a hundred texts in the Bible that mention this expression. Either the hand of God, the right hand of God, or seated the reign of God. So Google is the source of all knowledge. <laughs> it's the equivalent of papal magisterium today. <laughs> all right. Ascending of Jesus in heaven. That's Acts chapter 2, right? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1, you would check later on. Book of Acts. Jesus appeared for 40 days after his death. He talked to the apostles and so forth. And on 40th day, he took them up to the mountain and then he said goodbye to them. And then you, uh, Jesus was lifted up in heaven. So imagine the people looking up, right? And looking up, and then Jesus flied up, 
And then the clouds cover him. And the disciples just look, keep an eye, what the heck's going on, you know, this is disappeared. And then the, this, the angels come down and say, men of Galilee, what are you doing? Why are you looking up? And why? Sooner or later, he will come back again. In the same way you see him coming up, you will see him coming down again. That's the book of Acts. Uh, I will talk about that later, uh, but this is the origin of the story of Jesus ascending into heaven. Book of Acts chapter 1. With regard to the phrase, the right hand of the Father, over a hundred occurrences of this phrase in the Old Testament a few times, particularly in the book of Psalms, but then most of them in the New Testament. Uh, particular in the Gospel of John, the scene of the Gospel. So now, this is too early to bother you with hunter texts. You will fall asleep. So I will summarize them in five categories. If you look at a hundred and you sit it down and you turn it up, and you have five types of, they say the same thing but different emphasis. The first emphasis when Jesus is said to sit in the right hand of the Father is to show that he was the Son of Man. He's Son of Man. What does it mean, Son of Man? You look at Daniel chapter 7. Prophet Daniel chapter 7. In that, the prophet saw up a man sitting there, and besides him there's a Son of man, meaning a man. When you say son of man, it's a long phrase to say he's a man, and he's coming down. So when this text says Jesus ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, the implicit affirmation is that Jesus is that son of man in Daniel chapter 7. And what does it mean? It means that now we are at the end of time. The uh, Greek term for this is the eschaton, the last time, the end time. So Jesus, when the church confessed that Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father, it means to say Jesus is indeed that prophet in Daniel chapter 7, he is the last prophet, the eschatological prophet. The end time has come with Jesus. That's the first set. The second set is that Jesus is the, now is exalted, is glorified. So when you say that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, you mean that after his death, Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Jesus has been raised and now exalted, glorified for whatever he has done. He is now glorified by his Father to be now the King, sit on the throne. So a series of texts refer to the fact that Jesus was now exalted. He is not simply a human being, son of man that you see before. He is now glorified. He is exalted. He is now celebrated as the King of the whole world. The third set to show that Jesus was the high priest. Again, series of texts saying that Jesus, particularly in the letter to the Hebrews, if you look at it, when they say that Jesus is seated at the hand of the Father, they say, now he is the high priest. Jerusalem has been destroyed, all the sacrifices have ceased, and now Jesus is the true high priest. Not Caiaphas, not other guys, but Jesus, the high priest. So, the liturgy that we celebrate on Sunday is a reflection and a participation in the heavenly liturgy at which Jesus is the priest. Jesus, therefore, is the celebrant of the Mass that we have in this church. That Mass is a participation, a reflection uh, of the heavenly liturgy that Jesus is celebrating with the angels and saints. So the Sunday assembly is not just we getting together, have nice time. You know? It is a sacred 
uh, participation in the liturgy that Jesus performed in heaven as he sat at the right hand of the Father High Priest. The fourth category, if Jesus is the High Priest celebrating the heavenly liturgy, what does he do? The letter to the Hebrew says, he intercedes for us. He prays for us. So it's a priest celebrating liturgy, but for whose benefit? For us. So when you say that Jesus is seated right here of the Father, you mean that he's high priest, but he's the advocate. He's the one who's a lawyer praying for us, intercede for us. So before Mary and the saints and Norbert and Saint uh, Ebert, whatever it is, <laughs> you have Jesus is the one who pray for us, a continual intercessor. So it's not only we pray, of course we pray, but Jesus, the Son of God, God himself to the Father, he prays for us. That's the role of intercessor. It's the one who says, help him, right, to the Father, or bestow graces on this. So, uh, forgiveness of sins and renewal of the church and so forth. This is the role of Christ as he does, the intercessor. And the last role. So he started, as I said, son of man. He's glorified, exalted, Messiah. He is the high priest, he is intercessor. And the fifth category, you list them and you see, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. So this man who's sitting on the throne is not sitting there forever. He stepped down, he go down. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the title of the lecture, going up, sitting down, and going down again. And that's what the early church believed, that Jesus is involved in the history of humanity. This history is still going on and the, 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 the direction of human history is that this moment when Jesus come and judge the living and the dead, whereby he say, I am now the universe, the ruler of the universe, both the dead and the living. So, instead of uh, reading the 500, uh, the 100 texts, you could look at it and see how, of course, in the text, they don't do this sort of classification for you. This is my work for which I am paid, right? The Google doesn't do that for you, right? So you go to the Google, read the 100 texts, and you know that these are the five types. You can list them and, uh, uh, and see what it means. Next one. Ha! Ah. The question is how you speak about God, right? The language about God. <laughs> if I were a fundamentalist, or if any one of you are fundamentalists here, I don't know whether you are, I will have a great time. <laughs> so if you really believe that Jesus go up to heaven, I would ask the first question, is it by airplane, helicopter, or what? If he sit down, does it mean that God, the Father, has a hand? Then the right hand, the left hand? Who sit the left hand of God, the Father? If Jesus sat the right hand, who, who sit in the left? No one. I didn't say even Mary sit in the left. So there's this empty chair there, right? And then you have the notion of chair. Is it made of wood, of gold? It's like a man lago, everything is gold. <laughs> or is it, I don't know. So if you are fundamentalist, you really, really have a hard time answering these questions in heaven. It means, therefore, that this language is a metaphorical language. You have to read when you say, I believe that God, as, as Jesus said to heaven, sit at the right hand of the Father. Well, that's a metaphor. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean that's not true. But the language that we use to speak about Jesus in heaven or God is not the literal language. 
It's not the language that I can say, you know, you sat at the table. I understand that it's a literal language. You sit at that table. It's not alternative facts. They are facts, right? They are not alternative facts. They are facts. <laughs> but that's only life here. But God is, when you talk about, it's a metaphorical language. Now, that doesn't solve the problem. We know that in human language, we use words. Italian don't use words, the UN's, right? <laughs> That's what they express themselves. But if you are not Italian, you speak in words. Now, there are three ways in which words function. The first way we call it univocal language. Now, this is the language of every day. Of every day we use a new vocal language. You use one word for many different things, but in the same meaning. Chair, right? This chair, the chair you have in your dining room, the chair at home, the chair, even the throne, the word chair, it's you very different things. Uh, this is not very good, that one's very good, and so on. But we understand the word chair, even if you use of, of different things, right? So if you come to my home, I invite you to sit. Oh, please sit down in the chair. You understand what it means, even though the chair is not the one you have at home. It's much poorer, mine's much richer, much more comfortable, <laughs> right? But you see that, you understand, right? That diff, one word, different things, okay? That is common language. The second thing, equivocal way we use the words. This is very strange. You use the same word for two many different things, but totally different meanings. This is an accident of language. And you know the meaning only if you refer to the context. You don't need the context to understand, chair, understand that. But to understand equivocal language is very hard. For example, you all know the English word B-A-R-K. If you say that word bark, I do not know what you mean. So what was the first thing you think you come to your mind when you see the word bark? Dark, Dark bark. Obviously. But if I go into a forest and I look at around and somebody told me, look at that bark, I don't look at the dog. <laughs> I look at the tree. tree. Now, if you don't want to have fire, you have to rake the floor of the forest. Right. <laughs> That's a great forest management, right? <laughs> now, the word bark is used equivocally, right? Because the word bark use very different things. The bark, the dog, and the tree has nothing to do with each other. I do not understand it until I find myself in the context. That's very rare. It's an accident of language. Very rare you have that kind of equivocal language. The third, analogical language. This is the most common language that we human beings use. When you use one term, one term, to two different things, but more or less similar, not entirely similar, but some similarity and lot of differences. Now, anyone can use equivocal language, univocal language, equivalent. Only smart people can use analogical language. Why? Because it requires imagination. The two things don't look like each other, but somehow you could use the language in order to refer to them. For example, S-T-A-R. Star. Now, when I use that word, what do you think? Star in heaven, right? 
But there is another meaning to it. Similar but different. What's that? Who would you think? Huh? You. Of course I am. <laughs> I am the star. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, he dawned on him that I was trying to say that I am a star. Uh, smart people. They are always smart people. So I am not referring to the star in heaven. I am talking to someone who lights up huh? the star in a movie. You go to Hollywood, you see the star, and the speaker, the, the house, uh, whatever, the star. They are analogical language. The word, the same word, applied to two different things, not in the same way, obviously, but in some similarity. Actress so and so is a star. Actor so and so is a star because he functions like a star in heaven. He'll sign up all the lights and so forth. Now, that's the especially human language. It requires is that a lot of imagination to see similarity in the midst of diversity. Who does that work most? Who does that work most? You want to specialize in that language, you have to become a poet. Only the poet can use that the power of language analogically. So what happened in, analo in analogical language is you stretch out the meaning, stretch out the meaning until that breaking point. You cannot go further. Because if you go further, you bubble. No one understands you, right? But you are able to increase, extend, expand, expand the meaning of a word. And that's what the role of a poet. The poet play with words. You read in a poem. You don't say, what the hell does it mean? No, no, no. You try to understand what the poet is trying to hint at, right? So this is poetry. Now, this is what we use when you talk about God. All human language about God is analogical language. You cannot use univocal language. You cannot use equivocal language. If you want to speak anything about God, you have to use analogical language. And every preacher, as you know, is a priest here, some priest here, a good preacher is always a poet. If you are not a poet, don't go on Sunday. You put people to sleep. <laughs> you need to be a poet to be a good preacher. Preacher. Because you draw from human language, you stretch out the words until people, because the poet doesn't try to tell you the thing is, they push you to imagine a different world. Is that what the poet does? He, she presents a different world, using the same language of every day, but he or she is able to open up a new level, new vista, new reality, and now invite to enter through that world, and you leave that world. That's the role of a homily on Sunday. Homily is not a lecture. Homily is not to give you a biblical exegesis. That's done in a classroom. In the church, people come to understand and to leave that world for a week. And then they come back the next week. You have to feed them another vision of the world. And therefore, that's a poetic language, language that how to. But then if you have a poet, all this is to show you the last part. How many minutes I have? Oh my God, I can talk, I can talk. All right, no problem. In Christian theology, we call this negative theology. Theology negative. It has nothing to do with negative. No, 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 it's not a negative. But it means that our human language about God is not a language that gives information about things about God. 
it's the language of science. You want to go information by reality, you go to a biologist. All right? So, for example, those of you who have parents here, have little children, when they grow up, the first, first year, two years, the first question, what do they ask? What is it? What is it? They learn the language. So you give them the food. What is it? Oh, that's butter. Oh, that's cheese. That's beer. <laughs> I like beer. <laughs> I still like beer. I am not giving testimony to, this, uh, to the uh, Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that, right? The informational language, the kid, that's the first thing. So as a good father, mother, you say, yes, son, uh, this is called a car, this is called a uh, whatever, a computer or something. And then the next question they ask, age three or four, what did they ask? Why? And what's your response? Because. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> Because at well, that time you don't expand. I say, Shut up. Do what I tell you. No why. You stay here. Don't play with fire. Why? Shut up. Okay? <laughs> That's the negative theology. Theology negative. All good theology knows. At the end of the day, I do not give information about God. I say that whatever I say about God, end it negatively. What does it mean? Okay, here it is, an example. We all use the word Father to indicate God, right? God the Father. We say God, Father. This is common way to talk about God. Now, when you say God, Father, you do not mean that he is father the way you, you are fathers. Correct? No. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> that God is not the father the way you are father. Because that means finite, that means sinful, that means sometimes you... Uh, so, you affirm something, God is father. And then, on the same breath, you say, but God is not the Father the way all the Father of this world are. Correct? You follow me? Affirmation. God is Father. God is Shepherd. God is King. God is President. Whatever it is you want to use. And then in the same breath, you say, but what I mean is that he's not Father like this guy is Father. Although he's a great guy. I see him, he's Asian, right? We are always excellent fathers, so that's <laughs> right. But he's not the father like this. So the next person asks, so what do you mean? He's father, but he's not the father. We say, I don't know. Negative theology, I really don't know. I had to use human language to speak about God, otherwise I, I, I wouldn't. But I had to say something about God, but I know absolutely God is not what I say He is. And therefore, all language of theology is negative theology. Now, whoever says this is not me. I didn't say this for the first time. It is said by no one less than St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas says this, <coughs> we know that God exists, yeah, we know that, but we do not know what God is. Negative theology. Does it mean that I keep quiet? I had to talk about God. You know, I have a so talk about, but I, at the heart of it, I know what I say end up in negative theology. Which means that in my language about God, there is greater dissimilarity than similarity. Between God the Father and you as Father, there are greater dissimilarity than similarity. Who says this? 
not Peter Fathom, the Council of Lateran in the year 1215. They know that. They say there are greater dissimilarity than similarity. Now, if that is the case, then all language ends in negation. That is the language of theology. We do that all the time. That's the kind of thing that we write. <laughs> I teach a course, Death and the Afterlife. I love to teach that course because 60 students register, we are allowed to have only 35, I have 80, 60 on the way list. Why? They all want to know something happened, what happened after I die, right? Give me the information, where do I go? Heaven? Hmm, what hell? Hmm. Purgatory, something? And the first class, I tell them, if you come to this class looking for information, ask back the money. <laughs> ask back the registration money. Because I will not be able to give the information. For the simple reason is that I have done that. I've been there, done that. No, I've been there, done that. I can't tell you. So the afterlife, the language of the afterlife, language of theology is always the language of negative theology. So you ask me, what is hell? Well, I know something about but that's not a description. I've not been there, so I can tell you. It's not uh, I go there as a journalist, look around, go back and report to you what hell is, right? <laughs> Much less I have no hope to go to heaven, so I just look, I can't go there. I haven't been there. So the language of theology is always the language of imagination. Imagination, you imagine it and you stretch the language of love and, and joy and hope and banquet. Oh my God, there you eat all the things you want. You never have this world, you go up to heaven, beautiful banquet. And people ask me, will we have sex in heaven? Well, if that's what you want, you have it, right? If you don't want it, you might not have it, right? So make sure before you go to heaven, you make a list of things you want to have. <laughs> now, the liturgical language is very different. Liturgical language doesn't bother with this. Liturgical language is language of worship. And therefore, a praise. You go to church on Sunday, you praise, you worship, and you say in the creed, he is ascend to heaven, he is seated right hand of the Father, and he will come again to church, live in the dead. You are not required to sit down and say, explain to me what it means in the liturgy. The liturgy is not a language of explanation, of sitting down and analyze it. The language of liturgy is always concrete. A very concrete language, the language of almost every day of praise, thanksgiving, adoration, worship. Yeah, there is a meaning there, but it is not the purpose of the liturgy. That is a great mistake of many theologians who preach in the liturgy. Because they spend a 30 minute do exegesis. Who the hell care? I mean, Tell me how to live, how to worship God. So the language of liturgy is very different from the language of theology. So we say that the language of liturgy is first order language. And the language of theology is second order language. It is based on the liturgy, but it's a very careful analysis. And the last one is the mystical language. It's neither theology nor the language of liturgy. It's the language of mystics. The language of mystics. Now, you know that great mystics, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, they claim that St. John Paul II, also a mystic, 
because they live in the level of union with God. They speak out of their personal experience, what God is in their own life, and then they speak to us, not out of Bible or any theology, but out of their personal experience, who God is for them in their lives, and then they speak of it. So, for example, it's no wonder, no wonder that St. Teresa of Avila, not St. Teresa of Chai Jesus, St. Teresa of Avila lived in the 16th century, the Chai Jesus in the 19th century. But it's no wonder that St. Teresa of Avila, when they, she talks about God, at the end of the day she said, I really don't know. This is what I speak of my personal experience. And she has a lot of problem because the bishops and the theologians who examine her writings say, no, 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 this is not exact, this is not precise, but that's the language she speaks of her personal. St. John the Cross, her contemporary, hmm, the discalced Carmelite, he writes about God in poetry. He doesn't write in, po in prose. Prose is too and not enough, all in poetry. And then at the end of the poetry, he says, nada, nada, nada. You know how it is, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Three times. He talks about he see God. And then God is nada, nada, nada. This is the language of the mystics. They experience God as someone who is so overwhelming uh, that they themselves cannot talk about God. Now, with that, turn to the last part, I will end. So, how do you understand this kind of language when you refer to uh, God, Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father? So, let me read the first verse from Matthew 16, 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So here you have the affirmation of Jesus' ascension. He ascended into heaven, taken up into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. What here is the first indication, a first confession, that Jesus has been exalted from the dead and now proclaim the Lord, Curios, the Lord, the ruler of the universe and everything, angels and all human beings, all things are now submitted to him. Right. So this is a first submission. When, when therefore I go to Sunday, I say he sit at the right hand of God. This is what I mean in the first place. That Jesus has been exalted, or glorified. He doesn't end in death in the tomb. The second verse. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. John chapter 3 verse 13. So what does it mean here? It means that here Jesus is fully divine because he's in heaven and fully human because he has descended. Okay? And only because he's divine and become human and now he can go back again. Whoever has descended from above and now ascended again. So this is affirmation of Jesus' full humanity and full divinity. This is a, a splendid confirmation, affirmation, confession, that Jesus is divine, otherwise he would not be able to save us. This is a famous argument among the fathers of the church, Athanasius in particular, that unless God Jesus divine, he would not be able to save us. But at the same time, he saved us by being one of us. He is, or we say, he is consubstantial with us. He is consubstantial with the Father 
and he's consubstantial with us. And therefore sharing human life, everything that is human, every human reality every day has been divinized through Jesus. All right? The third verse, and when I, when I am lift up from the earth, I will draw all humans to myself. That's John 12, 32. And then the next verse is from Hebrews. He entered not into a sanctuary made by human hands, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. On our behalf. So he did not do it for himself, he does it for us. So here the role of Jesus as a priest. He celebrates the heavenly liturgy, and he's the one who prays for us, who intercedes for us. To, when we pray, we have the absolute conviction that our prayer will be answered. Why? Not because of us, but because of Jesus who intercedes for us. And that the conviction of prayer is not magic, it's not just uh, God magic. Uh, I go, I just know that I am not the one who pray alone, nor you alone, or we alone, but Jesus pray for us. So Jesus here is function as a priest and as a intercessor. And the last verse. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? So remember, we'll go back, chapter 1. Jesus was slipping up, all the despised look up, right? And then an angel came down and asked him, This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go up to heaven. This is the last part that most people forget when we say the creed. We always look into the past. What did Jesus do? We forget to ask ourselves, what will he do? He will come. So after the priest consecrated the host and the wine, people proclaim, let's proclaim the faith, the mystery of faith. And you all say, we proclaim that he has died, his reason, and he will come again. Now that is, reminds us that the work of Jesus is not yet finished. It's not completed. He still has a job to do. The third act. Descended, going up, going up, sitting down. But don't sit for too long because you have the next job to do. Only then the work of redemption will be completed. All right? But the problem is this, most of us looking up at heaven and just wait. <laughs> just looking up say, when are you coming back? Where are you coming back? The most obvious answer for us who go to the Eucharist is in coming back where? In this assembly, in the persons of the priest, in the bread and wine, in the people around us. There, that he comes. Again and again and again, he comes every time there is a Eucharist, Jesus come back and be with us. That's what you mean by the real presence of Christ in the bread and the wine. If he's not coming back, how can you be sure that he's here? That's the faith in the transubstantiation. That's a terrible word, but that's why we use it. Transubstantiation is the proclamation that Jesus in heaven is not sitting there. He come back every time the community gathered together to celebrate his memorial. And he's there. But where? Of course, among us. That's why we all are the body of Christ. That's why you are. That Jesus come back in the body of Christ. 
But notice, in the bread and the wine. Now, many of us, again, the word transubstantiation is just like a magic word. That somehow, you know, the bread. Look, uh, they are the priests here. I see some of them wear Roman color here, right? You take the bread, you say, Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. The priest said by himself, well, sometimes very quickly, and under a slow voice, you don't hear. The bread, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. Then he took the cup of wine, he said, Blessed are the Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness you have this wine to offer, fruit of wine, and work of human hands. Now I ask you, this bread, who made them? Where did it start from? From someone who sowed the seed, they grow up with the sun and the air and the water, and someone make it, and a woman, usually a woman, turn into bread, it doesn't come, the bread it doesn't come from the tree, right? You just come out and pluck it from the tree. It's work of human hands, the farmers in Wisconsin. And the sun and the star and the water and everything. Without that, this wheat cannot come to life. And then somebody go and just take it and uh, trash it. And then some woman uh, put the water and all that, made the bread and wine. That, my dear friends, is where Jesus come. That's where he come. And you ask me, who will? And then the wine, the same thing. The wine doesn't come from the liquor store. <laughs> you go on by, no, no, no. It's come from the grape. Someone pick up the grapes. Someone in other days, some on it and made the wine. I ask you in this country, who does this work? The migrants, the Mexicans. The, we, we don't think in these terms. It is the hard work of the Mexicans. Through them that we have the wine to celebrate the Eucharist. The wine doesn't come from, you know, rich people. They come from the poor people who work so hard, 12 hours a day, in the sun, bend over with a heavy bag and carry it. And that's what I say, when and how Jesus will come back. This Lord, I confess, is up to heaven. He sits right in the Father, powerful, but he will come again, and he will come again in the work of the most despised, hated, marginalized, as of today, considered as criminals. And they are the ones who provide us with the bread and the wine into which Jesus come. Thank you very much. We do have a few minutes for questions uh, for Dr. Fan, and um, I, I might have a microphone that works, so if you're of quieter voice, I'll try to come around to you, and otherwise, oh, I just hit a button that says mute. That was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, if you have a loud enough voice, just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you said was that uh, Jesus came to save us. Uh, I'm struggling with uh, how I should understand, or how would you explain the, the saying that Jesus came to save us? Yeah. Okay, 
uh, the notion is salvation. What does it mean to be saved, right? And now, how did Jesus save us? Now, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Christian creed symbol or confession of faith pro, uh, uh, affirm that Jesus <laughs> come down from heaven. Again, that's a metaphor. That's a language analogy. Jesus didn't come down the way the airplane came down to earth, right? So we don't mean that. It means it's a pro the, the act whereby God the Father has sent his son, so the idea of sending is more than just coming down. It, the origination is from God the Father. Right? The origin, the initiative of salvation is from the Father, sending the Son. Now, the form in which, the way in which Jesus came is through the human being, the Mary of Nazareth. So that's the historical event. Although the language is metaphorical, but event is a historic event. We know that there was Mary, she has a child, she gave birth to the child, and he grew up in Palestine. Now, so salvation, when you say God save us, we mean that it is first of all an initiative of God. Not us. We cannot do anything to save ourselves. It comes from the initiation, the initiative of God the Father. Then, how does this plan, initiation of God, initiative of God, carry out in the life of Jesus? Now, what did he do? We know that he preached. That's the first thing he did. He preached. So preaching is a work of salvation. But he also <coughs> performed miracles. We also know some miracles perform. Heal the sick, right? Exorcism, send out the devils out of the boat, we know that. Sometimes he performed some interesting thing like walk in the water or multiply the bread and the fish. It's not healing, it's not exorcism, but a miracle of nature. He walked on the water. And three times we know that he raised the dead. The son of the widow of name, uh, the daughter of the Roman centurion, and his dear friend Lazarus. We know that he did that. This is in the gospel, right? So here is how salvation is brought about. It's not about the soul. It's not something about the soul. It's a transformation of daily life. Sickness. Demonic possessions. Uh, lame, blind, uh, can walk, can see, can hear. Death. You see that? Right? So this is the way how Jesus saved. He works this one. Next thing you say, but for whom? For whom did he do all this? He didn't do it to the priests. Sorry. No priest was healed in the gospel. No priest was lame and blind. No priest was dead and Jesus raised from the dead. No, none. Rich people? Nothing. Presidents? Oh my God, no. Right? <laughs> What did he do these things for? He preached to the simplest, the poorest, the most marginalized people, tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, all kind. That's where his preferential love. He loved to do that for the people who are the marginalized of society, the migrants that he works. Right? And that's salvation. Salvation is not your soul. Salvation is a transformation of the daily reality, especially those who are marginalized. And this transformation is not yet finished. He died. There were thousands of people who died in his lifetime, and he only three. There were a lot of sick people in Palestine. He healed a couple, three, four, five people. So the work of salvation is now continuing by whom? By you and me. We continue his work. We preach. Sometimes if you are a doctor or a nurse, 
you perform healing. That's what you do. And God forbid lawyers, we don't need them. <laughs> oh my God, accountant, oh God, please. <laughs> but we need teachers. Teachers are the preachers. We perform the preaching activity of Jesus. We contribute, we work towards this salvation of Jesus. And if you are a doctor, you work. If you are a social worker, you help people, healing their mind. Okay, and everything, and that's why he will come again. He will come again. The job is not yet finished. So salvation, to answer your question quickly, is not just the soul, it's the entire reality, an entire reality of the universe. We today contribute to that, to our work, and only at the end of time it is completed. Okay, now, yes, uh, you have the back. In, I don't need the mic. In the language of teenagers, which I as a grandfather would never use, yeah. uh, the liturgy, particularly since Rome intervened, yeah. but also in itself with so many people, <coughs> sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How do we instill that awe that you're talking about, yeah. Yeah. that presence of Christ Mm -hmm. in a community that seems to come there often to fulfill a duty yeah. rather than to praise, praise yeah. and so mm -hmm. on. Thank you. A very good question. And I try to answer this. And first of all, you all familiar with the new English translation of liturgy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it totally sucks. What the hell? Who say he took up the chalice? What chalice? Poteron in Greek means the cup. That thing there. That's what they use. Now you put into the chalice. And how many people understand the word chalice? And you, the priest said it. And he, the priest even stumbled on the word. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and then he took the chalice. See, the idea of the translator of the liturgy is to say, the more obscure words you use, the more mysterious it becomes. And the result is that people are introduced to mystery, they result in non-understanding obfuscation. So the language of liturgy is a very concrete language. The, the, the everyday language. So when you say the Mass, when you enter into the church, you know this is the language of every day. I don't need chalice to introduce people into the mystery of the Eucharist. Right? Chalice. And so many offering. Everybody knows the word offering, right? But instead of using the word offering, what does the new translation use? Do you not go to church on Sunday or you want to sleep? <laughs> oblation. Oh my God. Oblation. Who the hell knows what it is? <laughs> oblation. It comes from Latin offere, meant to offer. That's all. But in order to do this, that guy in Rome has nothing to do with it. Okay, let's use the word, the most obscure word possible to confuse the people. Let's use the word oblation. You see that? So that's the first problem that as, uh, as a priest you face. You come to liturgy, they offer you a new translation. Now doesn't make sense to anyone, not even the priest himself, understand what it means unless you study five years of Latin and so forth, but you understand. So, turn the language into everyday language, number one. But you say, how do you introduce them to the mystery? If they use the every language, what is the mystery? The mystery is in the mist. The kingdom of God is a mist of them. So then, when in a homily as a priest or someone to teach religion, it's a, you have to say, mystery is not up there. Mystery is in our midst. So it takes a poet 
literally a poet, to see the different levels, the hidden levels of life. The hidden level of life. And you open up that level, and people say, oh my God, I eat food every day, I didn't understand what it means. Now I understand what it means to eat. To eat is not feeding the, 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 the hunger. To eat is communion. The saddest thing for you, for us to do, is to go to a restaurant and eat by yourself, and then put out your cell phone and check them out. What a sad thing. Because eating for all of us is a moment of sharing. And you recreate that by recreating in your life. Not wait until to go to church on Sunday and somehow, oh, here I am in communion. That's not communion at all. It's just people go up, get a piece of hose and go home and sit back. But how to, uh, this precisely, to open up the level of eating. Tell them what you mean when you eat in the first place. And here, you come here to eat the bread and the wine. And without sharing, there's no, 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 no Eucharist, no thanksgiving. And so you read the uh, first letter of Paul to the Korean chapter uh, uh, 11. He got mad at the Corinthians because they come each one eat by themselves. He said, what the hell are you doing here? You want to shame the church, right? You can eat at home. When you come there, you sit, wait for one another, eat one another, share one another, and then you have the Eucharist. That's what he goes into saying, as I was, I tell you this on Jesus. You see, the, 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 the actual Jesus and interpretation of the scripture really are breaking up, are breaking up, like we say in Latin, fractio panis, the breaking up the bread. Uh, and then the people can say, so I don't see the mystery by using this kind of convoluted, Latinized language at all. Uh, they confuse mystical, uh, mystical with incomprehension. <laughs> that, that's not. No? But mystery, is understand, mystery is seeing the possibility of otherwise seeing the possibility of otherwise. Reality like that, but below that, underneath it, within it, the, another reality, another level. And the ability of the preacher, teacher, preacher, anyone, poet, is to unveil that level so you see for the first time. If we're, if we're brief, one more question. I know your hand was up before, Ravi. Uh, well, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed um, this wisdom that you shared with us. One thing I'm struggling to understand is the last bullet that you explained uh, his second coming, yeah. coming in our day-to-day -day life right, right. as bread and the wine. Yeah. What I'm struggling to understand is if, if, if that's the case, that this is not an actual physical event that happens, do we control God's second coming? Like if there is no person on earth who does accept the bread and the wine, does that mean there is no second coming anymore? Are there multiple events of second coming? And when does this end? Or does this go to eternity? Thank you. Uh, I use the bread and wine as an example. I did not mean that that's only time, only place that God's coming again. Right, so, but because in the concept of liturgy, I use that. So I would like to uh, uh, correct myself by saying this is only an example, uh, maybe the best example that I can see how Jesus come again. Because Eucharist, as I said, we proclaim the mystery of faith until he comes again. And I said, where? In the Eucharist. But as you said, Jesus come again in the most in the most unexpected place that you can find. In a shake of hands, in a smile that you in when you see children run around, run away because of the gas, right? And you say, that's not how we act. And so we can see even that that image of the mother and the two kids running away in their, in their uh, diapers, running away from the uh, gas, right? You say, 
for the first time I said, this is not what human beings do, much less Americans do, right? So w that's the way, the very strange way God arrived, coming to see me. The, the only thing is sometimes we are so used to it, you become so used to it, you don't see the mystical dimension behind it. Even the act of eating and drinking, we take it so easy because it just happens every day. But if we make it meaningful, then Jesus when two or three gather together, what? In my name. Uh, in my name. In my name. Just you, know, you just can't go to uh, McDonald's and wait for Jesus there. It's, <laughs> you just can't. Because it doesn't require cooking and, and take hours of caring. That's why you go out and buy the food. So once a year, Americans have the Thanksgiving. Don't ever say turkey day. If you say turkey day, I shoot you. <laughs> Don't ever say turkey. It's the only moment in which the whole nation get together and say Thanksgiving. Why? Because the father, the mother, the cook spend so much time going out by the ingredients, spend the whole night before cooking. I don't know anything. I just make it up, right? So. <laughs> So that's what they do. And you, you sit there and you say, okay, today we'll give thanks for this, 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 this. Once in a year, once a year, that we make it. And now with modern life, it becomes so hard to have family eating together, grab here, grab there. But I know some family want, you know, they want. That's what President o Barack Obama did every day. He went to a meal with his wife, with his two daughters. Interesting. Imagine the current president sit down, have a uh, meal. He ate his hamburgers on his bed. How can you have that and say, okay, eating is a moment of sharing. You can't. You can't, under you have no sympathy for it. You see? Okay. So it's every day. But I use that. But then we know, we know that the end of the world, from even the cosmologists, and so away, the law entropy, you know that, right? The energy is diminishing and emission one day. As I wrote in my book, uh, it could end up as explosion, not a big bang, it's all gone. Or it could be a frozen, the sun the, it's disappear, and so the earth be so cold, much worse than now, right? And nobody is able to be alive. So this is a scenario that cosmology, so anyway, explosion or frozen to death, it seems to be the, the way how history will end. The question is, does it end in nothingness? as many cosmologists believe nothing, or is it in something else? That's what the believers say. It will be the reign of God. So that is the same event, the same exact event, but interpreted differently. The, the cosmologists say, well, nothing but it's gone, right? Believers on the basis of faith say, no, there is God, there is God who saves us, and to us this world will come to Imagine uh, the world in which ah, the gospel is so great. There's no more. Go to the funeral mass and the world, there's no more tears, no more pain, and no more death. That's the way how Christians imagine that world. Poetic language, poetic language, right? The world, no more tears. Imagine, no more tears, no more sickness and no more death. All right. Thank you. Right. So the, the next lecture is given by my dear friend Paul Wadeh, who is he? He has class. He has class, a poor fellow, yeah. <laughs> so, so he's a dear friend of mine. Yes. And, uh, so. Wonderful. Just a couple final thank yous. I know we're at time, so I'll talk even faster than I usually do. Um, so again, we thank Dr. Dan Ritter uh, for his sponsorship of this series.
Um, I believe our bookstore arrived while we were in here um, learning, and so uh, both Dan's book and some of um, Dr. Fan's books are available for purchase, I think, outside the door when you leave this morning. Um, we're grateful to all our colleagues here at St. Norbert who always help us put on such wonderful events, and in particular, I'd like to mention Martha Kudrowski, who's done so much to make today run smoothly. Um, you can see uh, Larry in the back from LA Video has been videotaping, and we remind you that we archive our lectures, and they're available on the Pilgrim Forum website, which you can find our website somewhere, oh, right here, uh, on the cover of today's program. Um, and then uh, I just did want to point out as well, your response cards are at the table. Many of you are already on our mailing list, but if you're not, here's a way to make sure you get us your address on the back. If you have comments or suggestions for future Pilgrim Forums, feel free to make notes on the front. And then, um, as Dr. Fan said, uh, we want you to know the date. It seems far, far off, but it, it will come oh so quickly, um, of our next Pilgrim Forum lecture in the spring with Dr. Paul Waddell. You'll also see on the back of this card promotion for two other events that come sooner in February. Uh, two evening lectures that we uh, commend to your attention and uh, offer you some information on them there. So once again, thank you all so much for being present and uh, thank you again, Dr. Fan.